Dear IPA members and friends, my name is Alexandra Danul and I'm president of the Australian Institute of Polish Affairs. IPA is a voluntary non-profit organization, a kind of a think tank promoting Poland in Australia and Australia in Poland. We form an intellectual circle, a group of colleagues and friends who meet regularly and discuss issues that interest us, issues related to Polish and Australian history, society, politics and culture. If you are similarly inclined, I encourage you to join our institute as a member. The history of IPA was most recently documented in a book titled Phenomenon Australijskiego Instytutu Spraw Polskich, Przykład Aktywności Obywatelskiej i Polskiej Inteligencji w Australii po 1989 roku, written by Zofia Kinowska Mazaraki and published by the Polish Academy of Sciences. Today, I welcome you all to IPA Zoom webinar with Professor Radosław Markowski, the distinguished expert in political science. He specializes in comparative politics, democratization, party systems, and electoral studies. It is a fascinating time in post-election Poland. We all wonder how the new government's creation is progressing and the key issues and obstacles that newly elected team faces. Professor Markowski will present an overview of several vital hypotheses relevant to the broad historical context of 2023 elections in Poland. His presentation will include causally deep explanation and broader contextual pan-European factors. Professor Markowski's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. Let me now briefly introduce <laughs> Professor Markowski to you. Radosław Markowski is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for the Study of Democracy, University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Warsaw. He is Principal Investigator of the Polish National Election Study and Recurring Visiting Professor at Central European University, CEU in Budapest. In the past, he was Visiting Professor at Duke, Wisconsin Medicine, and Rutgers universities. Professor Markowski has published in peer-reviewed journals, among others, in electoral studies, party politics, political studies, and West European politics. He is co-author co and co-editor of several books, among others, Post-Communist Party System, Cambridge University Press, published by Cambridge University Press in 1999, Europeanizing Party Politics, question mark, Manchester U University Press in 2011, and Democratic Audit of Poland, published by Peter Lang in 2015. Professor Markowski is a member of the editorial advisory boards of a number of academic journals, among them European Journal of Political Research, Political Studies, Populism, and European Union Politics. He is also principal investigator of several worldwide and pan-European projects, such as Comparative Study of Electoral Studies, CSES, European Election Study, EES, and European Social Survey, ESS. I now invite Professor Markowski to speak. Radku, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much of uh, also reminding me who I am. <laughs> uh, uh, I have to, before I start, I have one question. Uh, I am a university professor. I can speak for hours. So how long am I entitled to titillate you? <laughs> well, we... We thought usually it, it is it is about an hour, so the presentation usually takes about half an hour, and then the rest is discussion and okay. questions. But, okay, yeah. thirty minutes. Uh, so two more caveats. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, what you will see soon on your screens uh, is a strange thing, namely it is a, a word uh, written down presentation rather than 
PowerPoint and the explanation for that is I had uh, horrible experiences just a week ago with South African uh, zooming and uh, there was the, the quality of the sound was so poor that people simply couldn't understand what I'm talking about. So uh, just in case there is, I, I see that the link is very uh, effective today. Let's hope it uh, it stays like this. But just in case something goes wrong, you will have a possibility to look at the full-blown sentences rather than uh, than just bullets and, and points. And uh, finally, um, uh, let me explain why we, we discussed it with Alexandra at some point, why uh, this is less about post-electoral um, situation in Poland uh, I concentrate more, more on, on, on what has happened in the last eight years, not in terms of detailed descriptions uh, on, on what this, uh, um, how this democratic decay uh, was manifested in Poland. I'm sure you, you know all about it, but rather to look at the kind of um, try, attempt at explanations why. Yeah? So the tentative title is Poland Democratic Decay and Back, as you may notice with a question mark, because we are just at the beginning of a very <clears throat> problematic and, and uh, kind of um, uh, phase of our political life in which uh, many things could still happen. So the summary of the talk I uh, present here in six points. First of all, I'll make a few remarks on causality in social sciences, then on Peculiarities of the Polish transition of the late 80s, early 90s, which seems to me one of the fundamental uh, turning points, uh, uh, which allow us to understand why uh, uh, peace for the 80s was capable to running country in this way. And then what happened exactly in 2015? Then... Um, Three types of explanations among many. I have chosen these three um, because they represent some of them a, a kind of deep causality, like the issue of uh, Homo Sovieticus. Uh, as you can see here, it's written Homo Catholicus because it turned out ultimately that many uh, commentators, pundits, and um, scholars in my view, are completely wrong to assign the uh, malfunctioning of the Polish uh, uh, public domain and politics to the uh, legacies of, of, of communism, and I'll elaborate on that. Then um, I try to explain some of this by uh, century-old uh, theory of cultural gap, uh, William Ogbers, and then a kind of a procedural and uh, psychological explanation why actually uh, the revolt happened in 2015. But the uh, underlying um, narrative, which will be explicitly and implicitly addressed, is that uh, what we witnessed during this eight-year period was selective demobilization and currently probably uh, remobilization. That There are two stories to be told one is uh, strictly political uh, and the uh, reason why a plurality at best a very tiny ma majority uh, uh, plurality de facto was capable of having majority in the parliament and why the other side uh, was uh, pretty apathetic and then uh, a little bit about the problems ahead as i see it by the end of november 2023 so um Two key issues are here. Now, first, uh, do we, if we are willing to offer a kind of deep causal explanations, the major question is how far back in history to look at potential determinants. This is the old Putnam, Putnam, Robert Putnam's problem with North and South Italy. I mean, so we, we hear something about 13th, 14th century. And then the problem is how this, what was happening several centuries ago in Poland or, or Italy, uh, um, translates into contemporary developments. And it is not an easy task. And secondly, uh, which elements of the context matter? So let me start, uh, I will skip this one. Uh, in point zero, you see long-term historical events and institutions that had we had more time or I can go back to it in, in the discussion. Um, I, I think that a lot of this um, 
Poles' attitudes towards the public domain and, and politics uh, has to do with our long-term um, traditions like Liberum Veto, election of kings, uh, this golden freedoms and uh, whatnot. But uh, really what should uh, be taken into account is peculiarities of the Polish real socialism and the transition. And again, I'll go very briefly here. You have six points showing uh, what was the uh, idiosyncratic development of the Polish uh, uh, real socialism, uh, strong legitimized existence of a Catholic church, uh, private ownership in agriculture, academic freedoms, uh, liberal in inverted commas, of course, relatively more liberal censorship in culture uh, than in most uh, post-communist countries, a kind of collective leadership of the Communist Party in Poland, and no charismatic leader, which was a norm in a typ typical development in other countries. And finally, ultimately from 1970s onwards, a very strong and vibrant civil society openly rejecting communist rule and the Kremlin. Again, you know all of this, but when, when you look backwards and you look into why this kind of um, in this book, which was mentioned by Alexandra, post-communist party system, we make a point in this book that uh, rejecting the sort of Leninist traditions which American uh, so Sovietologists were uh, capable of uh, inflicting on us, we are uh, trying to persuade the reader that actually the, there were different types of communisms, if you will, uh, but definitely the real existing socialism were different. And in this uh, uh, East Central European uh, barrack, we see that Poland and Hungary, precisely the two countries that currently uh, are the, the bad guys of uh, democracy in the European Union, we dubbed them as national accommodative communism, socialism, which was uh, um, distinctly different from uh, uh, the ones uh, that uh, occurred in the Balkans or Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia. We can go back to that. But let me now concentrate on the real important issues, the Polish transition. First of all, the the strong point I want to make, and I, whenever I'm a reviewer or I, I, I discuss uh, with my colleagues dealing with this transition, from the historical perspective, our transition will be in the encyclopedia um, uh, uh, labeled as transition that started actually in 1980 and not in 88, 89. Uh, the same actors, Jaruzelski and Wałęsa, were uh, already on both sides. Then there was a short intermezzo of the, of the martial law, uh, and um, uh, three years later, uh, both sides started collaborating again, in, in a sense, how to uh, find uh, an outcome of this uh, cul-de-sac, as the French would say. So... Um, and there were uh, numerous procedurally non-legitimate attempts at a change in Poland uh, via social contract. Ultimately, it was uh, uh, hammered out in 88-89 in, uh, uh, at the round table. Now, the second point, uh, so my point with the first one is that unlike in other countries, uh, the, the, the exit itself, I mean, I'm using this Huntington's uh, three phases, exit, institutional, building of institutional infrastructure, and then democratic consolidation, it was visible that in Poland the periods are very prolonged, unlike in Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, or GDR. Secondly, <clears throat> institutional infrastructure uh, was uh, 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 built in Poland under very high uncertainty concerning the Kremlin's reaction, as you know, and this is very important contextual variable, as you, as you, of course, know, those at Kremlin had a very specific sense of humor when talking to the reformers in Eastern Europe. It was experienced by uh, by Noj in Hungary in '56 and by Dubček in '68. So, uh, um, in '88, '89, we were definitely not uh, clear uh, what will be the reaction, the ultimate reaction of the Kremlin. The result of this is exactly as theoretically was predicted by Stein Rocken, multiplication of veto points and institutions because of the uncertainty of the first comers and their uh, 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 fluctuating status. 
Finally, the democratic consolidation, uh, the, to use the uh, Linz and Stepan parlance, where well, the only game in town is already there, uh, 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 has been uh, achieved what seemed to us very early on. That is to say, the first turnover in which the re representatives of the Ancien Regime come back happened in 1993, and by 95, Kwasniewski became the uh, um, fairly elected president of Poland. Now, the point I'm making here is that the ultimate, so the phases were mixed, overlapping, and prolonged. The ultimate result of this, this prolonged period of transition via institution building to consolidation was that a culture of sort of rules of negotiability, norms, flexibility, growth of pragmatic instrumentalization of political domain, and if you will, a mood of temporariness of the enacted solutions was dominating. This means that citizens in Poland and in Hungary as the second in a row country did not actually see precisely the clear critical juncture separating the old from the new. Let me remind you also that our constitution was approved only in 1997. Uh, by that time, Bulgarians, Romanians, Czechs, and others had a uh, new constitution, new governments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the big question is what happened in, 19, uh, in 2015. Um, now Poland, uh, from the perspective of uh, the transition the theory, was the least likely case for democratic decay because of many reasons, and they are enumerated here. Strong solidarity, self-organization, transition back by pact, early pro-democracy consensus among elites, supportive international environment, moderate social inequalities, etc., etc. Opposite arguments were also articulated, namely that there is too intransigent church. Uh, having a control of the souls of Poles, nationalist traditions, dominance of inflexible socioeconomic assets like land uh, rather than uh, uh, other. A very specific Huntingtonian problem of transition, too much mobilization at the expense of institutionalization, and this was really uh, there. Obviously, selected historical legacies that were definitely conducive to democratic revolt, turned out ultimately like religion, nationalism, and ethnic homogeneity, hel less helpful for maintaining the, uh, the democracy, democracy in the long run. After 2015 elections, and this is something very important to be emphasized over and over again, that um, what happened in 2015 election is that peace government was supported by barely 19% of eligible voters Yet it translated due to wasted votes and uh, other uh, uh, details of the electoral system into 51% uh, uh, majority in the parliament. But right from the beginning, it's, uh, I mean, nowhere under proportional representation such miracles happened that 19%, 5.7 million voters out of 31 eligible to vote created a majority in the parliament. And if you look at Hungary, Orban really enjoyed a real constitutional majority right from 2015. So the big difference between Polish peace, Kaczynski and Orban in, and Fidesz in Hungary is that um, the uh, big constitutional changes implemented in both countries were legitimate in Hungary, formally legitimate, and in Poland they were not. So... What followed, and this is the part you relative, you, you know pretty well, were fundamental uh, dozens of fundamental breaches, uh, breaches of the uh, uh, not only uh, decent democracy, but the spirit and the letter of the Polish constitutions, and also violations of important international treaties. Uh, and let me also go to something that many people tend to disagree, but uh, I think that during this period of eight years, uh, the social reaction and the distaste for what this peace is doing was relatively moderate, uh, to say the least. I mean, of course, in 2016, there was powerful court, uh, but, but later on, there were a few protests by women concerning the abortion issue, etc. But other than that, if you compare it to the a uh, magnitude of protests in 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 Romania, let's say, or in in even in the Czech Republic against Babish, this was not a very strong social uh, rejection. 
So all this, uh, when uh, we looked at uh, what peace is implementing in Poland, brought into question Poland's status of a consolidated democracy, as defined again by Linz and Stepan, that all major political forces consent to playing under the existing constitutional rules of the game, and that there is no and that there is a widespread and committed citizen supporting the democratic values and norms, especially the latter one was clearly not there. So um, the, the, the further question follow from this, was Poland naively and prematurely declared consolidated, uh, though it wasn't, or was it uh, experiencing a process of clear deconsolidation from a truly consolidated embedded democracy? Uh, moreover, the decay of the liberal democratic model in Poland started after a quarter of a century of a smooth social and economically very successful period in, in Polish history. By the way, I make a short remark here that uh, I'm dealing with the issue of populism, illiberalism, etc. Uh, I, I think that this uh, easy uh, um, dictum that says, well, populists and illiberals pop up where crisis knocks at the door of a country, I don't agree with that. And that there are numerous examples, uh, Turkey, Poland, uh, that show that populists dare to come to power and violate the liberal democratic principles precisely because there is economic success in a country and not the other way around. So two hypotheses were also tested by us. Firstly, uh, did the crisis uh, and the dissatisfaction with the pre-2015 reality originated in society or was it driven by political agency, a skillful politicians accompanied by power, powerful social groups and institutions. Um, now, again, something that I could elaborate, I have two articles or presentations of that. What we have seen in the Polish national election study is that actually in Poland, we, we, we were witnessing a, a creation of a what I call disfigured or ori cleavage. Cleavage typically has two signs, political cleavage, which fight each other or at least institutionally differ. Now, in Poland, what happened during this period was that on the side of, um, of uh, peace, there was a, a really well-organized, disciplined camp with ideology, with enemies, with we-them narrative, etc., etc., while on the other side, there was uh, more of a chaotic um, uh, 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 people uh, running around, but uh, certainly you couldn't call it a camp of believers, devoted believers to something. So this this is something also to be taken in, into account that, uh, in fact, peace was very successful in getting this, how you organize society following part of the enlightened, uh, in inverted commas, ideas of uh, of Orban, who was extremely successful in reorganizing the Hungarian civil society into a real, uh, um, a real uh, um, camp. Now, the other way to approach these issues, what happened in Poland, uh, is to see uh, uh, what is going on in terms of our uh, socio-philosophical, socio-ideological attitudes. There was a strong, again, um, message by pundits and some scholars saying that uh, Polish society is very traditional and that's why. Well, uh, let me tell you that in the Polish national uh, election study, we ask a battery of questions and uh, it's absolutely clear that from the societal point of view, majority of Poles were leaning towards liberalism, cosmopolitanism, enlightenment values, and so on. The problem of Poland is that this minority or plurality, tiny plurality of people whose world was starting to disappear were extremely over proportionally mobilized politically. So there are two stories, and if I have time, had I had more time, I would have elaborated on that that uh, uh, de facto, you know, this is that, that their world is disappearing. And, and uh, if, you, if you know, and you certainly know that the, the electorate of peace has this very specific traits, it is, we, we never witness such a biased electorate. I'm sorry, I'm using descriptive language here. It's not evaluation. The, the, they are elderly, they are old, they are rather poorly educated. They come from 
rural areas and and provincial areas and they are out of labor market and that that is a classical transfer classes that supports them um so uh, these people uh, link very strongly to the church are feeling that that something that they they were having this idea that Polak Catholic and 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 this idea is is different is disappearing for good in in the in the second part which I have to skip a little bit and this is uh, I'm sorry uh, I'll go back to this uh, Polish Catholicism in a minute but this is a graph uh, until 2015 you see here um, a graph of uh, the GDP for uh, a dozen or so countries of East Central Europe. If you take as 100% of GDP in 1989, Poland by 2015 is at the level of 215, 220. Next in a row, Slovakia and then Estonia are uh, uh, much, much be behind and the other countries even more so. So uh, basically what I'm trying to... Uh, say here is that um, uh, by 2015, not only GDP, not only GDP per capita, but also unemployment and, and um, inequalities, which went down from very high inequalities in 2002 to 0.29 Gini coefficient in uh, uh, 2015, there were no roots, there were no reasons for a um, bottom-up uh, revolt. But unfortunately, um, the political uh, um, skillful uh, messages and appeals of um, uh, peace. I have to uh, this this um, uh, slogan: "Countries in ruins" uh, worked so um, pretty well. Uh, so what we what we had before the 2015 election was this uh, at the subjective individual level, uh, pretty. Uh, uh, satisfied Poles with their households, with their jobs, with their expenditures, etc. But at the level of the aggregate uh, evaluation of, of how country develops, this country in ruins uh, did work uh, effectively. Okay, so uh, my major point here is to say that uh, a classical supply side nationalistic authoritarian conservative revolution started in 2015, and it was not a, a, a bottom-up thing. Then I refer here to famous Przeworski's uh, parlance, uh, uh, pointing that we have tested this also empirically, that um, <clears throat> Poles had a very limited um, uh, ability to um, really understand uh, this uh, uh, fundamental key uh, uh, trait of uh, liberal democracies, that this is institutionalized uncertainty, that there, are, there should be stable rules of the game and uncertain results. Uh, peace did what it did, and it tried to reverse this relationship to, to have certain results with uh, fluid and uh, uh, non-stable electoral game uh, rules. Um, then, uh, now, because the time is running out, few explanations why. It is a long story. It is published in two or three uh, places. Uh, this Homo Sovieticus, this strange idea that what is going on in 2015 has to do with our deeply rooted communist or short socialist features of Poles. Now, first remark is, of course, had it been uh, Homo Sovieticus, then this effect of Homo Sovieticus must have been a lot, a lot stronger in, in Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, and elsewhere, because Poland by far was the less Sovietized of these countries. But when we looked at the real causes of this, what we know already, that there is a low social capital, especially the bridging capital, that there is a kind of a lack of um, uh, sensitivity to the public good and very, very privatized Polish society, we see it precisely in the Homo Catholicus rather than Homo Sovieticus. It is those people who are strongly attached to the Catholic Church in Poland that unveil a, a, a syndrome of um, features that are unconducive to liberal democratic uh, uh, um, to liberal democratic uh, context. Uh, I can elaborate on that later on in, in the discussion. So the result of that is um, 
as you know, the message of the Catholic Church, this one, I'm talking here not about religion, I'm talking about the institution, is a, a daily rejection of enlightenment values, disrespect for science, causality, positive law, medicine, etc., etc. And of course, the narrative that, of course, you small, you, you, you uh, people, you can have your constitution, you can have your positive law, but the truth is in the book. Right. And if, if such a message as a major socialization is uh, offered to the society, then there is a fruitful soil. If Kac when Kaczynski comes to power and says, quote, that uh, uh, constitution is just a, a, a sheet of paper. So the ultimate result is that it's highly privatized so societies with limited appreciation of public good. Uh, common interest, and actually this is precisely what peace was so capable of utilizing. They got it right, that investment into roads, into railways, into kindergartens, a real building of a welfare state, it, it, that is not something that average Paul would understand, but investing into private pockets would do the trick. And that's why, because let me also remind you, they still have 7.5 million supporters. It's not that they, they, they were crashed in this 2023 election. Then there is a, I'll only mention this, a cultural lack theory, which basically says that you can treat uh, a political infrastructure uh, uh, and the, the idea, the, the way it works, the liberal democratic, uh, you know, uh, checks and balances, separation of powers, etc., as a technological invention, which, like it or not, it came to Poland from other countries. It was an adopted by diffusion uh, idea. And it didn't work so well for many in this society. And there is plenty of indications that uh, de facto we have, uh, and I enumerate here many, many, uh, um, many uh, Polish attitudes and, and preferences that are uh, at odds with what the Polish constitution offers them, we can we can discuss it later on. Uh, and finally, there is this big thing, big question. I mean, why why would part of a well? I'm talking about 2015 and Kaczynski's decision. Why would part of a well-established political elite take such a risky course of action? Peace Party has long been benefiting from access to state and public sector jobs and other resources in a system that had already witnessed several electoral changes of power. Why would they abandon the relatively safe political functioning under democracy for an extremely risky strategy of a constitutional coup d'etat? The answer is complicated and multi-layered, but one of this is something that uh, uh, could be derived from the traditions of underground uh, self-organization. And here uh, the, uh, it goes by saying that Kaczynski and others were used to this personalistic loyalty and, and personalistic uh, organizing of a group uh, uh, based on rather loyalty than meritocratic principles. And uh, um, uh, it has uh, had, however, a clear spillover effect on the early post-communist political culture, and in some instances, as this party and its leader witness, at times pretty durable. These legacies uh, are accompanied by a lack of public transparency and malfunctioning of institutions as designed by law and regulation. Instead, key political decisions are taken in closed, trusted circles hidden from public supervision. So that's one. Uh, the, the other is... Uh, uh, this is an ultimately it leads to a transfer of the radical authoritarian mechanism from the internal party mechanism to state and governmental policies. On the other hand, as I've already mentioned, this miracle that happened in 2015, right from the beginning, seemed to them to be not replicable again. I mean, they 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 knew that they will never ever, which was wrong because they did it in 2019. In a, in a free and fair election, get the majority of the vote with the 5.76 million people. Uh, why it didn't it work differently, it's another matter. So uh, to start uh, uh, summarizing this, the name of the game uh, between 2015 and uh, even until uh, recently, uh, the, the name of the game in Poland was the selective demobilization. And on the other hand, over-mobilization of the ancient world supporters and distinct demobilization of the liberal cosmopolitan camp. 
This is what we have seen in the past. <clears throat> uh, as I've already mentioned, this Polak Catholic uh, persuaded by peace uh, entrepreneurs was uh, truly thinking that their world of Catholicism, uh, decent traditional values is to disappear very soon because of LGBT, because of migrant, because of other. And then what happens is that majoritarian status in society is very likely to evaporate. That was the the, the, the great message of peace to the, to the people. And uh, it seemed that it worked for a certain period of time. And currently, it it sort of disappears. If you look at the religiousness uh, uh, um, uh, data, which we could go into, uh, six point seven million people uh, during the last decade stopped uh, identifying themselves as Catholics. Uh, a very low figures of church attendance in some areas, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, what happened in the 2023 election is this widespread mobilization of the liberal democratic camp. The election was still was free, but unfair. Finances captures uh, capture of the public media and unequal. The strength of the vote in provincial rural areas uh, was much more valuable than in metropolitan areas. And actually, one of the very first things this new government has to do because of the forthcoming election is to uh, uh, rewrite the uh, or redesign the uh, seats in accordance with uh, the voting population. Um, so, but like it or not, 35% of active voters, 7.6 million, did vote for peace in 23. I think it's a remarkable result, provided what they've done in this in this period. I mean, it's very similar. It's almost an equivalent of the 8 million supporters they had in 2019, as there were less eligible voters in 23 by some 700,000. In 2023, just like in 2019, extremely biased sociodemographic uh, profile of, of these voters. Again, uh, majority poorly educated people outside the labor market, predominantly above 60% rural areas. 16... Uh, 13.6 million of votes, other than peace parties, voted against them, out of which uh, 11.6 is the new democratic uh, opposition. Astronomic turnout, as I call it, turnout of 74%. As you know, the average since 1990 is about 50. Yet, one should bear in mind, and we have it documented in, in the Polish National Election Study, uh, uh, at each election, polls were showing up, half of them, at the polling stations. But if you, long, if you look at them in the longer run, approximately 70 to 80 percent of them were voting in some of the elections. So this mobilization had its roots in, 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 in the voting experience. However, uh, uh, this time around, they, they, they mobilized themselves for this particular election. So the big questions now that we know what happened in this election, namely that uh, there was a very, if you look at it in relative terms, mobilization of the youth. The big question remains, were they so active because they are young or because it is a generational phenomenon and it will be with them for another 10 or 20 years? Indeed, women were mobilized, maybe by sociocultural issues like abortion, church, theocratic health services, but we don't know yet whether they were also uh, uh, activated, mobilized by economic issues. This will be known in a month from now. So the list of potential explanatory factors is long, and I enumerate them here as, as I have to stop in a minute. Um, uh, uh, let me also uh, uh, point to the fact that we have to look precisely this time around uh, into Polish religiosity, the role of the church. Uh, as I've said, uh, there is a, a steady decline in religiosity in church attendance. And um, the big question again is, is it is it stable uh, phenomenon or is it uh, just... Uh, a pattern that occurred around 2023. So problems ahead, very 
clearly uh, what is ahead of this new government is dire economic and financial situation, huge expenditures and public debt are outside the official one. We, we still don't know how much. Uh, the 2024 is, uh, we have a very tough electoral context in April, local elections in June European Parliament. So my uh, um, fear is that certain necessary policies might not be implemented on time. They will be delaying them because of the campaigns and campaign promises. The big issue here is how far will the depicization reach from minor marginal returns to normal to widespread and this deep sanatia, the cleansing reform focus, not only on manifestations of the wrongdoings, but their sources as well. Among the latter is the new emplacement of the Catholic Church as the key issues, also their public role, property and finance. And this is uh, uh, explicitly uh, 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 indicated by most of the politicians of the new uh, government to come. We have to return to EU community with ideas about new openings of the organization and Poland's place in it. And uh, the, the issues, the big issues here is the Anthropocene, the climate change, EU defense, migrants, abortion issue, and a biased profile of the Polish energy sector, which are problems in itself, and none of the government can easily tackle them. And of course, the big question is what next with Jarosław Kaczyński personally and peace radicalism versus moderation? One of the that we are thinking currently of um, whether he will go and start a, a very radical battle with the new government, or would it be more advisable for them to pretend they are a, a, a sort of civilized, moderate opposition and come back to terms with European Union and, and other actors. Uh, we will have to see. The first uh, uh, slogans and goals, fight for Poland's independence, uh, is uh, um, currently being uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, emphasized by Kaczyński. So... Uh, these are the uh, few of the of the problems ahead of us, and I have to uh, I, I I have to stop here. I would be uh, happy to answer all detailed and general questions. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I'm just watching the clock, and it's just eight thirty. So we we actually had fascinating Absolutely. discussion, and I'm so grateful to Professor Markovsky for joining us today and everyone else who joined us today in our circle of friends and uh, and I think uh, it was a truly fascinating webinar and uh, thank you very much all of you thank you yes and particularly you. professor Markovsky thank you very much